yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity to present here uh, and sort of discuss some of the interconnection challenges and I think successes we've had uh, over the last three years developing in New York. Uh, next slide. So just a little bit about Rebel. Uh, so Rebel uh, started as a electric moped company in 2018, but started pivoting to an all electric ride share and EV charging company in 2021. Uh, since that point, we've acquired 550 EVs, have 1,000 professional drivers that operate our rideshare uh, product, and then we've also built 54 fast chargers uh, throughout New York City that are open 24-7 to the public and have uh, 300 charging stalls in development uh, in the New York area. And uh, just a little bit about uh, our charging growth mm -hmm. over the last year. So uh, last year around this time, uh, we were doing about 100 SSDs and now we're doing about 1,000 uh, a day. So a, a 10X increase uh, in year over year charging growth, with, which I think speaks to you know, how the New York uh, city market is maturing. The next slide. So this is just a good graphical representation of, of sort of Rebel as a company. So uh, as I said, we have our, our ride share component, which utilizes our public charging. Uh, and then we have our public charging, which is really uh, open and accessible uh, and meant to sort of be an easy, uh, no friction charging experience. Uh, and then we're building these sort of big hubs in dense urban areas, uh, including New York City. So uh, we're working with fleet charging customers to allow their vehicles to charge at our sites overnight uh, and you know give those last mile fleets the capacity to uh, transition to EVs. And then uh, looking forward, uh, we're working uh, on grid services. So how do we provide demand response? How do we provide vehicle to grid? Really the next generation of technologies, how do we enable our charging stations to uh, really step into the future? And we've worked with Con Ed on a pilot there and we're working with NYSERDA nice on a full scale uh, V2G site. Next slide. Uh, and just, you know, I think it's worth just uh, really spending a second focusing on our model just to make sure we're all on the same page. So our sites are open 24 7 to the public. It's all fast charging. So all 150 to 400 KW. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation, that really means there's uh, a lot of uh, power that needs to be interconnected to our sites. Uh, everything is CCS and NAC, so we're, we're vehicle agnostic. Uh, and there's no uh, hidden fees or parking fees, so sort of a market rate per kilowatt uh, hour charging fee. Uh, next slide. And then this is just a graphical representation of sort of the market growth that I explained a little bit earlier. So uh, in November of 2023, uh, we were at a little bit under that 100 number, and now we're consistently doing 1,000 SSDs a day. Uh, that's really been driven by green rides. So um, there are about 2,000 uh, ride share vehicles, Uber, Lyft vehicles, Rebel vehicles uh, in the New York market that were electric. Uh, because of green rides and the 2030 initiative to electrify this sector by 2030, uh, there were 10,000 new licenses put out on the streets. So now there are over 12,000 of these vehicles. And you can just see the direct impact that has on site utilization. Uh, and there's 100,000 of these uh, ride share vehicles in total that need to electrify by 2030. So I think it shows just how many stalls we need to really build to enable that uh, full electrification process to happen, uh, not even mentioning uh, all of the public customers that will be using EV charging as, as public customers electrify that live in multi-unit dwellings uh, over the next uh, five years. Uh, next slide. So this is just a, a stall build out, sort of, you know, what we're uh, doing in New York over the, over the short term. These are the sites that are opening this year or next year or so. Uh, Pier 36 is actually opening tomorrow, which we're very excited about. The sites in blue are already open. And then uh, we have a site near LGA, uh, JFK, that are opening uh, early next year. Uh, and then we have sites uh, in Mass Beth, Port Morris, that are opening next year as well. So uh, really just continuing to really invest heavily in New York, uh, investing where rideshare drivers live, investing near airports where rideshare drivers take their longest trip and, you know, uh, do most of their charging to try to avoid uh, big deadheading trips uh, today. And really, we want to make this network as fast 
as possible. So, you know, when you talk about rideshare drivers, it's really, you know, time is money. So how do we get our charging sessions down to as little as possible? How do we provide as much power to our sites as we possibly can and just make that experience uh, as easy uh, as possible? Next slide. Uh, and then this is sort of uh, Pier 36 is the site we're opening tomorrow. And um, I think it's it's worth talking a little bit about because it's our first service upgrade. So all of the other sites we've opened to this point were power ready. Uh, and this was really the first time we we took on a full interconnection process, a full design process with Con Ed. Um, this site was actually just energized yesterday, which is which is pretty amazing. Um, but you know, it, there's a lot that goes into this. All of the equipment that had to be uh, raised up because it's in a floodplain. Uh, so you know, really just working arm in arm with Con Ed on the design process, on the interconnection process uh, to get to this point. Um, you know, it was a lot of learnings for, for Rebel, but I think it puts us in a, a really good position in this market to kind of speak to uh, what some of the challenges are and I think what some of the progress that's been made, uh, you know, working with Con Ed here. Uh, next slide. So this is just a graphical representation, a, a design drawing of Mass Beth. This isn't the, the latest design of the site, but just putting this out here to, to show you sort of where things are going. So um, Pure 36 is 1100 uh, KW of interconnected load. Mass Beth is 4.5 uh, thousand kilowatts. So it's it's uh, it's about four times uh, more interconnected load. And to do that, uh, it's just a lot more complex of an interconnection process. So we need to build. We're building a block house here. We're building three voltage transformers uh, in order to bring in this much power. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of design complexities that go along with that. Space allocation drawings. Uh, build out, fitting out of a block house, all sort of new challenges for Rebel, but uh, new challenges for this market in general. Uh, I think this is the first uh, EV charging site in Con Ed service ter territory that's going to have a block house. Uh, so, you know, again, just, you know, I think Rebel is really on the forefront here of the interconnection process uh, as far as electrification goes, uh, specifically around EVs. So, uh, I think it adds a little context to the, the sort of challenges and recommendations here. Uh, next slide. So just want to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, what site delays kind of mean for electrification and building out EV charging. So um, really the first thing is uh, we sign leases based on when we think these sites are going to go live. So if it, they, you know, that schedule falls, uh, especially by long periods of time, it just makes it much harder to bring these sites to profitability. Uh, I think, you know, most people know on this call that EV charging uh, is a low revenue business. Uh, so, you know, really um, having that kind of uh, hit before the site opens is, is really impactful. So I think it's important for everyone uh, that, you know, we move we we move along timelines uh, efficiently and quickly, and then there's clear timelines laid out uh, so that you know our expectations uh, are understood going into these sites. So we we really are able to maximize uh, them. And the second thing is just makes it harder to move on to the next site. So you know uh, I spoke about sort of Rebels development plans. We we're trying to build 300 stalls in New York City, but you know obviously there's capacity. Uh, internally on our team uh, and with the teams we work with. So if we spend more time on one site, then that waterfalls to the next site uh, and this compounds sort of these delaying problems. And then it also just has, I think, the macro uh, problem of lowering the EV adoption curve. You know, if all these sites are taking longer to come online, there just simply isn't going to be the infrastructure for someone living in a multi-unit dwelling who doesn't have access to charging to go out and get an EV or a rideshare driver that currently has a Suburban and for all the operating benefits would love to go out there and get uh, a new uh, Lucid uh, uh, GM EV, but you know, has, it doesn't have access to the fast charging infrastructure to do it. Uh, next slide. So I just wanna talk about some recommendations and I think, you know, I'll start by saying that uh, we've been working with Con Ed now for over three years uh, and uh, the process has improved Tremendously, and I think a lot of that is just communication. Um, you know, it, it's just we're all trying to do things here that are new, uh, and it's really speaking the same language and understanding the review process on both sides. Uh, you know, that really has has yielded a lot of benefit. Um, but you know, these recommendations speak to you know places where I think we can you know still see some improvement. So you know, create guidelines for overall timelines. So I think this is really just you know how long is it going to take for a site to go from 
you know, starting the design process to energization. And, you know, this is a, a multi-step process and obviously there's gonna be times where, you know, things uh, fall back for various reasons. And obviously, uh, you know, these timelines are gonna change depending if it's a 208 service or it's a 480 service that needs a block house or any of those things. But I think just, you know, agreeing on, on clear timelines, what are our timelines for these sites? So when we go out and we do acquisitions, we understand, you know, okay, it's gonna take this long to energize this site. We can set those expectations with landlords. Uh, we can pick sites that we feel uh, make sense economically over a long period of time. Uh, and then also, you know, what are what are all the steps in that design process, right? You know, what what do we have to do? Do we need to do space allocation drawings here? Do we need to, you know, what are the exact what are the steps we need to take uh, in order to, you know, get that site to energization? Uh, the second is, you know, reviewing n minus two requirements. N minus two requirements play an important role. Obviously, they ensure uh, reliability in the grid, which you know is sort of. Um, paramount in, in New York City and, and I think has, has shown that, you know, uh, over time uh, creates a very resilient grid. Uh, but, you know, I think it, when you look at this from an EV perspective, it makes sense to, you know, look over and review these requirements and consider if there are innovations that we can make in that process that are going to lower costs and shorten timelines. And ultimately, I think mainly uh, looking toward removing having to build a block house uh, for EV charging sites. You know, when you get to a certain load and you want to build a, a very large site that has a lot of power coming into it so that you can provide fast charging for every one of these stalls and, and make sure these sites are future proof so that, you know, when you go into year two and year three and year four and you're seeing high utilization rates, you don't have to lower your charging speeds. Uh, you know, you need to be able to bring in a lot of power. And right now, in order to do that, you need to build a block house. And that can be a very expensive process, but it's also a very time consuming process. So, you know, just a review of those requirements to see if there's maybe a different way we can do that, I think uh, would be really helpful. And then the last recommendation here um, is just instead of incentivize speed uh, and utility delivery. So I think it's really just make sure that, you know, the resources are available uh, to clear the interconnection queue. I, I think everyone knows here that there are like long interconnection queues in pretty much every market. Uh, and that does, you know, has to do with electrification of everything. Uh, and that's great. And it's great to see that progress. Um, but really just making sure that we're investing in building capacity, right? So making sure there's enough crews available, making sure that we go and proactively look at distribution networks, specifically around transportation hubs, big highway nodes, and make sure there's accessible power so we don't get into situations where uh, there isn't the available power to build out uh, these charging stations. So. Uh, that's really uh, brings uh, my presentation to a close, um, but, you know, uh, happy to answer any questions if, if that's part of the format of this meeting. But uh, Lisa, thanks again for uh, uh, letting me uh, take the time to present here today. Thank you so much for presenting. I'm um, we do. I don't see that we have any questions, but. Um, if anyone has any, you don't mind answering any. Sure. Um. Well, it looks like we don't have any, but I really appreciate it. This was very uh, informative. I really liked the recommendations. I thought they were very helpful. And so um, I did see I did see one hand, Melanie. If you did oh, have a question, we we have time. Okay, sorry, I, don't, I still don't see it. So oh, sorry, I took my hand down because I thought we were moving on. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> Melanie Franco from Couch White for the city. I'm just curious, how long did it take um, from start to finish for that Pier 36 project that's just going live? Yeah, so we started that project around September of 2021, uh, and it's going live tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So almost three years. But I would say that uh, that wasn't just interconnection. That pro that project's being built on a pier uh, and in a flood zone. So we needed to raise up equipment uh, doing construction on a pier. Uh, so there were there were that was a very complex site that you know we felt is really important because it's it's really the first uh, fast charging open open charging environment uh, in, in the central business district downtown. Uh, and we really felt that investment was really important, uh, especially for rideshare electrification, but uh, it was a very complex site to design, develop and build. Okay, yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I was just curious, so thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay, I don't see anything else, Jake, but, and I know that you have another engagement. So I really, really appreciate this. This was very informative and helpful for us.
Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Take care. Take care. Bye. And now, um, I think NIPA, John, do you want us to um, share the screen, John? I think you said that you would share your screen. Yeah, let me see. I'll, I'll, let me see if I could share my screen. If not, I'll, I'll ask uh, for your. Absolutely. Anything. Yep. Um, let me see. Is my screen? Oh, visible? you got it. Yep. Oh, good. Good. Uh, so really appreciate the invitation and you having us uh, speak on the Evolve New York program. I'll give a quick overview of the program and then um, focus in on some of the key utility issues involved with building out a fast charging network. Um, Evolve New York is the largest state-owned uh, public fast charging network in the country, for those who are not familiar. And you know, most people are familiar with NIPA as a generating utility. Here's um, a map showing some of our generation facilities around the state. We also operate uh, transmission. Um, but when it came to the adoption of EVs in New York, we saw that there was like a critical missing link. And um, we got the program funded back in 2018 because um, this map here is showing the, the Evolve network and our current status, and I'll speak to it a bit, but back in 2018, this map would, would have just been a desert of DC fast charging. For any you know non-Tesla um, DC fast charging, it was all sort of clustered um, in the New York suburbs and a little bit in Albany, and there was really nothing north or east of that. So, um, you know, when we asked our board for the funding, we basically said, look, it's impossible to drive a Chevy or a Ford EV um, from New York City to Buffalo. So why would anybody buy these vehicles? And how would we ever get the greenhouse gas reduction benefits unless somebody built out a DC fast charging network? Um, so we were able to get the seed money, seed money to basically um, build out, be the first mover and build out um, the backbone of DC fast charging statewide. Um, our goal by 2025 is to have 400 fast chargers. So these would all be 150 kilowatts or above. Every site would have uh, four chargers or more. Um, and we're currently at 170 chargers at 43 locations. So those, those are the green dots. Um, those yellow dots on the map are sites that are currently in construction and the red dots are all um, sites that we have signed um, that we're going to be going into construction fairly soon. Um, goal was very similar to the federal NEVI program, except we predated it. And that was you know, having these fast charging hubs at regular intervals along all the uh, key highways around the state. And also the enablement of um, electric uh, taxis and ride share, uh, just like the folks at Revel were mentioning. Um, our site at JFK Airport was uh, 10 150 kilowatt chargers. It was the fastest uh, or the largest non-Tesla fast charging site uh, on the East Coast for quite a while. So there are a whole bunch of steps involved in owning and operating um, a fast charging network. It goes all the way from the site acquisition uh, stage of really finding the appropriate real estate and engaging in all those contracts, then the whole construction phase, and then ongoing operations. In terms of site acquisition, it was way harder than we thought when we finally uh, signed up the program, got the funding. Um, you know, finding sites that have both uh, sufficient grid capacity, so typically about a megawatt for our sites, sometimes a, a bit more. Um, very challenging, um, but also making that dovetail with good amenities like, um, you know, bathrooms with long operating hours, uh, nearby food, um, not trivial at all, and trying to get it close to a highway, you know, within a mile or so of an exit. Um, really, really challenging, and then getting those uh, sites to be willing to sign a long-term multi-year agreement uh, for us to site this on their uh, property is really not trivial at all. Um, it, it typically takes us uh, anywhere from six months to a year to sign up a host site. Um, then we go into the construction phase. We, we have a, a whole vendor team doing everything from the permitting to design to construction and a whole bunch of subcontractors. Uh, most of our network is on Electrify America using BTC fast chargers. 
um, and then using uh, some New York based vendors uh, like plug in stations online as a subcontractor. And uh, some of our older stations are actually on other charging hardware uh, with other vendors, but uh, all our chargers going forward are on the Electrify America network, but they're labeled as Evolve New York. And just to give a sense of the timeline, um, utility engagement really occurs very early in the process, but then during the design and construction, there's a lot of touch points uh, with the utility that we're connecting to. But from the time we execute an agreement um, with a host site, uh, like say it's a convenience store or something like that, um, to the point where we're actually, the chargers are lit up, they're operating, it's open to the public, typically about 16 months. So it's, it's, it's small construction, but also, you know, time consuming and, and, you know, there's just so much need for this. Um, we're already seeing our charging stations, even in some of the upstate locations, um, being completely slammed and having waiting lines, especially on weekends and during holiday periods. Um, then we have a whole operations phase. Once we're built, we own it. Um, we're closely monitoring availability uptime. We have uh, contracts in place to make sure technicians are dispatched quickly um, whenever we do have an outage on a charger. Closely monitoring plug-in success. Uh, we monitor our customer satisfaction scores, um, monitor the um, social media. Uh, just to make sure our users are, are having a good charging experience. And then we also do a lot of outreach to potential EV drivers to let them know this charging network exists. And there are other fast chargers as well around the state. And that traveling around the state is, is completely doable in an EV at this phase. And um, then just honing in on the utility process. Um, when we started this, in 2018, it, it was really stone age compared to what we have today. Um, the anecdote I like telling is, you know, we had a particular exit on an interstate. We wanted to build uh, a fast charging site, uh, you know, roughly a megawatt of load. Um, went to the, the uh, distribution utility in the area and we said, look, we're negotiating with two uh, convenience stores. One's on the east side, one's on the west side of the interstate. Um, and we need to know which one has, you know, sufficient capacity because we haven't signed with either of these people yet. And we were told to submit load letters, which, you know, is a pretty involved process on a site that's speculative that we don't know if the landlord's ever going to sign with us. Um, and then you think about it from the distribution utilities point of view, um, they're doing a, a whole service determination uh an analysis for sites that are speculative maybe neither of those uh landlords would sign with us so we're wasting everybody's time um so you know once make ready passed and there were these capacity maps it was just wonderful we weren't shooting blind anymore we could you know look at these maps without ever bothering anybody at the distribution utility um, and decide which of these sites were just out of the question. It would be way too hard to get the the, um, the load capacity needed to develop, and we just wouldn't even have a discussions with those landlords. Uh, so it really streamlined the process on our side, and I'm sure uh, saved the distribution utilities from having to process lots of speculative load letters uh, for no reason. Um, so the hosting maps have been huge, but in terms of um, areas for improvement. Um, the hosting maps we found are about 90% accurate and up to date. Um, so about 10% of the sites we've developed so far, we get sort of an unpleasant surprise once we put the load letter in, uh, service, de service determination comes back and um, it's nowhere near what we thought the capacity was according to the maps. Um, so, so, of course, that information on, on those load maps could always be more, um, uh, you know, quickly up to date um, with more current information so that we pull that 10% number way down. Um, so overall, like th those hosting maps are, are a huge plus, uh, but they could be uh, improved. Um, also, the timelines on service determinations. Um, 
sometimes they're you know exactly what's promised and they're a reasonable turnaround um but in in some percentage of the projects they were significantly longer uh than what the utility initially promised us um so you know we advise the utilities really take a closer look at this see if there's additional staffing needed um or outside engineering capacity it could be brought in because it, it's really key to that overall project timeline i mean we don't break ground at all until the service determination is completed um and there's just so many of, of the milestones in the construction project they're just waiting for for that service determination to come back with a green light um huge benefit is having those dedicated utility ev groups um as as somebody who's developing dc fast chargers it's really hard to work through the maze of all the different departments of the utility you might have to work with like distribution engineering or billing um uh, the real estate department if, it, if it's an easement issue um but having a dedicated EV person who understands DC fast charging, understands the issues that a DC fast charger developer is dealing with, that you could make one phone call um, and that they're doing the chasing and the expediting on their side and trying to figure out who the right people are is, is just a tremendous benefit. Um, what we found that the differing levels of success in terms of expediting, um, we found on some cases, the utility um, EV specialist can really expedite their internal people and get um, the needed paperwork through so that we can go to the next milestone in developing these sites. Um, but other cases, it just seems like there's, there's some frustration and, and processes are just taking longer than anybody would like. Um, another issue that that's come up is just uh, transformer stock and visibility into that and i'm not sure what the solution is there but um just raising it as an issue if if um you have a program like ours um with a goal of having about 100 fast charging locations and you have a sense of you know i'm doing x number in a particular uh utilities territory um there's this concern on our side that eventually we'll hit a wall and there won't be a transformer in stock um, to meet our project timeline. And, you know, it, hopefully it's a worry without cause, um, but historically every project we've applied for, um, the distribution utility has told us, oh, we do have a transformer in stock. That's the, the correct rating for that. Um, and then we give them the date for when the transformer pad will be ready. And they're, they have that um, transformer earmarked for us and it's you know scheduled and it arrives within you know, days of what we all agreed to. So it's been a success so far, but knowing that transformer lead times are um, about 16 months now, I've heard two years on, on some uh, transformer sizes. It's a real concern that like we'll hit a wall on that one. And I'm just not sure what a good solution would be th that everybody would know this is where we stand for, for transformer stock. Um, but you know, on the positive side, I'd say every one of the utilities we're working with in New York um, continually asks us uh, for feedback on the process, um, on how they're going so far, asks for our opinion, ways they can um, perform, um, improve performance and, and tweak the process. So that's been very, very encouraging for us. And that's everything on my deck. I'll stop sharing and just open it up for any uh, questions or discussion. I don't see that anybody has any questions. Oh, Michael D'Angelo, do you have a question? Yes, hi, thank you very hi. much. That, that was extremely interesting and, and very helpful. There were a lot of um, timelines that were mentioned uh, in that. And I know that you've uh, learned a lot since you've been doing this. I guess just so I could wrap my head around it, what would you estimate like Say right now you just 
you, we all decided, okay, we needed an EV charging station, you know, about here, you know, pick any spot. Um, how long do you think it would take from making that decision until it's actually cars are actually able to charge um, take effect? Yes, yeah, great question. It varies a lot from site to site. I understand. And you could give a big vary. Like, yeah. you know, it could be anywhere from one year to three years. I, whatever it is, I don't, I'm yeah, just it, trying to understand. Yeah. And, and, and I'd say the two years is a good rule of thumb as an average. Um, like some of the host sites have taken six months to a year to sign our contracts. We've had a handful where it was in weeks. Um, so that's a variable. Uh, permitting for some of the municipalities we worked with, um, very reasonable, like weeks. Um, and you know, drawings come back with some minor red lines. We make the adjustments and we're, we're off to the races. We've had other municipalities where the drawings sit around for months before we could break ground. Um, so those are all issues that, you know, I, I spoke to the utility timeline issues that um, can come up. Um, and uh, sometimes there are even host site issues where we agree on a layout. Um, then once we begin construction, they, you know, stop the presses. No, we really want you on the west side of the parking lot, not the east side. Um, throws all sorts of roadblocks in, and you know, for the north, the northeast, the other big one is weather. Um, if we have a really mild winter, we keep the construction timelines going, but that's not always the case, especially upstate. Um, and um, asphalt plants uh, close uh, for those winter months, so the sites that go in the queue for the winter aren't like totally finished. Like you might have plates so you could sort of open them to the public but they're not really finished you can't do all the striping and and paving um until the weather clears in the spring so two and a half years could be completely reasonable three years on some of these sites but um under a year is is absolute best case is is maybe you know something like 10 months so i would say that's the 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 range there really helpful thank you All right, thanks, John. I'm not seeing any other questions, um, but I appreciate your presentation, and I'm glad to hear that it um, has the entire process has vastly improved since 2018. That's positive, and that the utilities are getting feedback from you. I think that's um, those are all good things. Thanks. So let's see, we have gravity now. Dan, are you able to present your own slides or would you like us to present them? I can present, thanks. All right, awesome, thanks. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Moshe Cohen. I'm the CEO of Gravity. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to speak to you guys. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to work closely um, both with DPS uh, and the utilities and you know, the previous speaker. Um, so, yeah, let's go right ahead. Please stop me at any time uh, with questions. I think. Um, this content's gonna be a little bit different than the other ones. So um, general overview for those who don't know us, uh, Gravity is a New York headquartered uh, company. We were founded in 2021. Um, we had a very brief stint as um, a yellow taxi. We introduced the first Tesla Y and Ford mach -E yellow taxis, including working on a pilot to allow for uh, EV yellow taxis, the pilot has become uh, now permanent. Um, and um, what we found very early on, actually, we originally thought we would deploy this big fleet of yellow taxis. Uh, we like the yellow taxi brand and also thought that 
as one of the, you know, as, as, as vehicles that could be summoned by op or street hail in a very dense area, they may be a great testing bed for the efficiency of EVs. So that was something we were interested in. We ordered um, the first 50 uh, Tesla Ys originally. And then, um, however, we took this perspective that in order to be an operator, um, there needed to be operating efficiency. So again, like the operator of yellow taxis, which we, we were going to be one of them, uh, would have to have an advantage relative to the garages, various garages operating yellow taxis, um, because we were operating EVs. Um, and in order to do that, uh, it was clear we needed to deploy charging infrastructure. Um, we, uh, since we were at very close, uh, working very closely with Tesla, was also very supportive on the pilot. Um, and at the time, was very interested in proving that a Model Y could be the next, um, you know, Toyota RAV4, uh, which probably they achieved with some success. Um, we needed to deploy charging infrastructure. We were agnostic, so we spoke to all major charging uh, infrastructure um, OEMs, all of them. Um, it, those were very productive conversations. They shared with us not just their product, but also their roadmap. And what we found was that. Um, in New York City, we're headquartered in Manhattan, which is probably the best example of a very dense city. Um, the charging infrastructure was just literally couldn't even fit, but also was just not the right technology that was needed for densely populated cities. And the reason was that it was physically too large, it was way too slow, it was too expensive, it was not um, addressing the problem in the right way. That was our, our, our view. And so rather than, and then, you know, running the first two taxis already proved to, to have a lot of trouble relative to, um, you know, running a, a sort of like a Toyota fleet or, or, or whatever the comparable fleet was. And so uh, we very quickly decided to uh, focus on really this, this charging infrastructure and um, that's evolved quite a bit. So from a hardware perspective, you know, we started with a hardware perspective, it was very clear to us that hardware and software had to be linked. And then um, I looked very closely. I have a background in industrial organization and energy. Um, as I revisited the pricing and the utility sort of side of things, uh, it, it, it just unlocked what I think is this tremendous opportunity for us as a country, but also a tremendous opportunity for us as a state and as a nation in, in how we um, progress towards uh, in this sort of like green transition, uh, including uh, EVs and other uh, fuel switching and renewable sources. And so where we are today, and what, what, what I'd love to sort of focus on for the next 15 minutes or so is why really I think the, the, the focus needs to shift. And I think this will actually alleviate some of the concerns that were brought up um, by, by the previous presentation, where we think of ourselves as, as a company that's really helping build the grid of the future and uh, as such, we're you know, very much a partner to the utilities and, and, and Public Service Commission. Um, and what we're doing is we're using our EVSE, which we actually call them now DEEPS, which is, stands for Distributed Energy Access Point. So the, the hardware that's required to um, you know, create a link between the, uh, the, the vehicle battery and the utility feed is actually the physical platform for what is needed for what we think is a critical step towards the grid of the future that'll, that'll be able to tackle the challenges that, that we're facing. And so um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our technology, but just at a higher level in terms of what's happening, the way we present this is, you know, the older approach was, you know, utility demand, I mean, electricity demand is, was roughly constant for a while, it started to increase, of course, shooting up more recently, but EV charging was sort of seen as like a necessary new load that had to be incorporated and essentially the grids have to um, take that into account now with rising data centers and AI, AI and building electrification and so on. But really the EV uh, charging was sort of a nuisance which hopefully would bring in other benefits. Our approach is, is actually the opposite. We, we actually think that um, the onboarding of EVs is, I think it's likely more important for the stability of a resilient and powerful grid then for the sort of later benefits of electrification, right? Like we're sort of, um, you know, we, there, there's some front loading costs in terms of emissions and climate, and you hope to get a benefit further on uh, from having um, mobility being clean. But I, I think the 
future that we're moving towards is one in which we need a lot of storage for temporal shifting of, of power, in some cases, spatial shifting of power, and this new reality where uh, you know, any, any vehicle owner now has a battery, which is, is, is probably a storage capacity of several days, if not more, of the rest of the consumption of electricity they have. And these batteries are domiciled exactly where they live and work and where they're going. I mean, is an enormous opportunity for the broader um, goals that we have in terms of like the future of our grid. And so if we take the, the challenges, right, which is, um, you know, which by the way, what's really interesting, I, you know, I've traveled all over the world looking at what other cities are doing in countries. And, you know, when you look at China, um, it's interesting because they started a lot earlier and they're investing very heavily, but they have a bit of a different um, challenge, right? Because in the case of China, they're less worried about the, uh, whether the power generated is clean or not, right? They sort of just want to win in manufacturing of EVs. We care about both, right? So we, we want to um, both increase the share of uh, electricity supply that we're able to do, but also do it in a clean way, which means we're retiring paper plants, we're retiring um, some of the polluting plants, sometimes not in concert with the demand, which is of course creating an issue. And then we're massively increasing the share of generation coming from abundant sources, many of which are renewable like uh, wind and solar. Um, and so uh, that is happening, of course, as there's a very uh, stark increase in overall demand of electricity um, from multiple sources. And you know, estimates vary as to the scale of this, but it's extremely significant in terms of what's coming. And so I really, to reiterate, I think what we're talking about today is critical. I think um, utilities that adopt this approach will thrive, and those who don't will uh, be in a lot of trouble um, sort of in future years to sort of um, support uh, what's coming. So, um, so what we, when we think about EVs, we're really, we're really thinking about them more like BEVs, right? We take out the, the B, but we're thinking about them as batteries, right? And we're just, we're thinking like, okay, um, there's all these batteries that are coming online. I think the statistic is something like 90% of grid connectable batteries that are coming, coming online the rest of the decade um, will be in EVs, in vehicles. And so um, we see the EV batteries as critical grid balancers. Like they will be absolutely critical. I think the way people talk today about range anxiety, they'll soon be talking about power anxiety because you know we're, we're seeing these massive um, price disparities and quantity disparities over, over time. And people who are at the mercy of sort of consuming power when it's generated or you know when they need it without having the ability to smooth, they're just gonna pay you know, orders of magnitude more uh, in a world where people don't just, just don't have that excess, um, uh, those resources. And so um, we see EVs as critical grid balancers. In fact, we, and, and this is gonna be the theme of what I talk about where, uh, which I, I mentioned in a previous talk, where when we think about onboarding EV charging, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna say this a few times because I think it's critical. Um, the first uh, wave of this was Let's just see, we're gonna sort of spend a bunch of money, increase the amount of money, let's let the industry figure it out, let's see what technology happens. I think where we're going is that um, the utilities should really, really care a lot which technology is deployed, and because the, the, the right technology is really gonna be a critical partner and an integral part of the delivery part of, the, of our own uh, and distribution of, of power. And so, uh, what what what's going to happen, and, and I'll show you some examples of this. But um, if if you deploy the right thing, if you do the right thing, uh, we will have abundance, literally abundance of power. And you know we'll have clean power, we'll have abundance of power. It'll be low cost power. It'll be you know great things happen. If we continue this approach that we're on right now, which is you know let's just see what happens. Um, I think bad things will happen because the um, you know the utilities traditionally have very little visibility in what happens behind the meter. Um, you know, a lot of these loads that are being uh, put on, I mean, there's some discussion of increased utilization. Of course, people use spurious methods of what utilization actually needs. And um, a lot of these installations are creating uh, peaky loads that are very hard to balance and don't have the capacity of doing anything other than being a power sink or a power draw. And this is going to be very difficult to manage. Plus, on the other hand, you have all the challenges that are happening, you know, on the um, consumer side, residential, commercial side. So um, 
our approach is, you know, and this is what really has been so exciting about Gravity's approach. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I expect that this approach won't just be us. And I, I think we'll have, uh, you know, comp more competition. But I think the bulk of our competition is not really in market right now. And, you know, we started with a very simple approach from, a, from again, from an um, aspiring uh, fleet manager uh, to just say, like, well, you know, why don't we bring the charging to the cars rather than the cars to the chargers? Because who wants to go to a gas station? And plus, despite all this fast whatever people are mentioning, it's not fast. It's a lot slower than a gas station. It's extremely painful, and it's not going to work. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be more convenient to bring the charging to where cars are domiciled? What that turned into is actually that is by far the way more efficient way to go about where we put charging and where, and where we do the interconnection, right? And so what our focus is on, and maybe I'll touch a little bit on the previous talk, but um, we're really thinking about it in the opposite way. Like where, where is there, where are there buildings right now or where are there loads right now? Or where, you know, where is there distribution where there already is power, not necessarily just access power that's never being used. Of course, that happens too, and that, that's maybe nice to start with, but really start thinking about thinking about this a little more regionally, right? Like, like which blocks have a lot of power, and if they have a lot of power, let's look temporarily at like what they're consuming, because the first generation of the way these interconnections were working is the utility would do a two-year study. Of course, they had to do extensive amounts of time because the COVID data was, was, was somewhat spurious. And then try to figure out like where can we find access capacity that's never touched. Like that's not the most efficient thing to do. The most efficient thing to do is to think of um, you know is to think of electricity the way we think of uh, databases and storage and computing, right? Because we're going to need a lot more of it. Think of it as more a shared resource. Think of where are there where is there electrical infrastructure that, that that's already been deployed, and then ask it can can we actually share those resources better and you know, can we think about a, a cluster size of power distribution as more than just, you know, one utility feed, which could be one building or part of one building, but actually think of the cluster of, you know, maybe the, 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 the main transformer or the substation, uh, one building, multiple buildings, a cluster of uh, loads and power. In some cases, there's PV, there's cogen, there's multiple feeds, there's different consumption patterns. Like, we should really think about this more as a cluster and then ask the question, if we're onboarding these EV batteries, which as a battery are gonna sometimes require power and quite often be available um, as, as a grid balancers, particularly if the um, EVSC equipment is where vehicles are parked already, it's not these you know, ambitious dedicated sites that people are talking about where you're only gonna be there as little as possible, right? Um, then there's a real opportunity to kind of solve a bunch of problems at the same time. And that's what I think what, what we're achieving here and what we really hope to do a lot more of uh, jointly with you guys. So um, ju just to be clear, uh, you know, people talk about bi-directional loosely and these V2G pilots and all this kind of stuff. And, and frankly, um, one of the challenges we have as a company is really uh, educational because people have misused a lot of terminology um, and, uh, actually created a lot of confusing terminology, I think, too, uh, for marketing purposes, and it's very unhelpful. Um, you know, when people talk about bi-directional or pilots or whatever, like th th this is, first of all, we need to be talking about um, UL listed 1741 SB, latest standards, and we need to be talking about essentially uh, an EV battery that is essentially available to the grid in, in, in a significant amount of time that is parked using the existing infrastructure that's there, not some tiny pilot with Nissan Leafs that don't exist anymore or some trickle down, you know, small thing. This is like at scale, are we able to say when new EVs are introduced to market, those batteries are available uh, as, you know, for either primary ancillary services or insurance, right? Um, in all places, cars are parked. And so this is something that, that, that we've been doing from an architecture perspective. So from an architecture perspective, when we think about the power that we need. We're thinking, you know, that our distribution, you know, we have our conversion, um, you know, our power conversion, AC to DC. Um, we have uh, switch matrices, which we can do with contactors or power electronics. And then we have our distribution. I think um, fast forward a few years, anyone building a building is going to need this type of infrastructure. It's going to be part of the switch gear room. It's going to be a critical part of like how you size uh, building loads because 
all buildings are going to need batteries as balancers, and those batteries are uh, probably going to be inside EVs, whether they're transient or you know building EVs or so on. They're not going to be some huge batteries that aren't even allowed in the buildings. And so the approach that we've taken is again, we don't even call it charging because that's that's really not even that's the immediate um, use, but that's not the probably not even the most important use. We have our, what we call distributed energy access points. They are uh, aspirationally going to be like um, outlets, right? Very small, so that essentially, um, where whenever and wherever EVs are parked, they're able to be connected. In other words, have access to utility feeds, um, and and that's that, that's what we mean by access points. Um, our focus has been in the areas where we have the biggest competitive advantage, which is um, you know in very dense areas. Again, people talk about installing in dense areas, but usually you look at where they install and then it's some huge open air parking lot, right? Which is completely, you know, outlier, right? Like we're talking about installing in dense areas where people are parked now, which means we're installing at curbside, you know, we have a, we have a product that is um, 200 or 500 kilowatt and a fit in a similar um, size to um, the first wave of these sort of six kilowatt level twos um, or in underground parking garages where there's literally no space, and um, you know that's where people are parked right now. And for the foreseeable future, that's where you're going to have EVs. And by the way, that's where you also have it, buildings and other utility feeds. So it feeds, feeds in that nicely. And so what we're doing, just as a further illustration of what I was mentioning earlier, is when we connect an EV to an access point, that access point then connects to um, a building feed. What we're doing is we're unlocking a lot of um, underutilized electrical infrastructure because let's say if there's a 4,000 amp service or a 2,000 amp service that is going is only being used you know um, very seldomly at full capacity the excess uh, capacity that could go through that infrastructure is now available to the vehicle batteries right uh, solar by the way is a great example because you know we come into sites where there's overproduction and there's nowhere to put solar that's not going back to grid uh, and we're able to sort of utilize it. So even just by the pairing of the access point, we are uh, creating a lot more value for the electrical infra infrastructure, both the utility side as well as the building side, because now that electrical infrastructure is able to flexibly go to more places, including these, these vehicles, which is very critical. Of course, everything we're doing is bi-directional already. I, I don't even know, other. I see, I see this mentioned in other cases, and you know, I really, I scratch my head because um, we've gone through a UL process, which I think many people know how hard it is, and we're going through a UL process on bi-directional, and these are all new, new, completely new standards that nobody's passed, not passed all the tests, nobody's passed any tests yet, and, you know, it, it's a very complex process, and, um, you know, people talking about obsolete equipment is bi-directional ready, it's just, it's just completely false. So, uh, we built a system that um, is literally capable as is. There's a power module swap that we have, you know, that you could select fully bi-directional ready. When I say bi-directional, I mean, you know, if it's a 200 kilowatt or 500 kilowatt dispenser, you'd be able to go back 200 to 500 kilowatt per dispenser. If you have a few megawatts per site, you can go back at several megawatts back into a building or back into a grid with the existing infrastructure. And that's why we call it um, an access point. Now, as a, byproduct of this approach, centralized architecture, sharing power with the building and other, other uses of power generations and loads. We have created the fastest charging uh, in the country, definitely for light duty. We're, by, of course, UL listed uh, by UL, by far the fastest. Um, and we've deployed this in, not in some hypothetical part of the city, but on 42nd Street, a block from Times Square, in one of the densest parts of the city, um, this has been deployed for months and, and, and is charging every vehicle model available faster than reported anywhere, including now we charge cyber trucks faster than Tesla. Um, so this is not a hypothetical, this is deployed, but I just want to stress that the charging speed, which is critical, right? So just saying that you can charge, that you're a fast charger, if you have a 50 kilowatt or a 70 kilowatt unit, I mean, that, that's just not true. It's not fast, right? The comparison is compared to gas. Um, our, our, our units as deployed can do uh, 500 kilowatt continuous, which is, we call it 2,400 miles per hour or up to, um, up to uh, 200 miles in five minutes, um, which is coming, which we're able to do this with new batteries. Uh, we've charged vehicles at 
I think 370, 380 kilowatts already. Um, and um, we expect this to get better and better. And again, our power distribution can go to a megawatt, right? But 500 kilowatt is what we were able to, to do. Can, can you go back one more slide? Yep. So um, let me, let me uh, talk a little bit. Am I okay with time? Okay. If, uh, if I'm getting to a five minute mark, Lisa, please tell me, but hopefully it should be uh, okay. Um, so how did we achieve this, right? Or what, what do we think are the critical components for achieving this? So uh, first of all, uh, what has happened across the country, which I think has created a lot of these distortions is, you know, I was talking to, uh, I won't say exactly who, <laughs> one of the main, uh, you know, city agencies uh, who said that they meet with everyone. They met, they said they met with like 140 companies that are claiming and doing EV charging right now. You know, we, we know what are the uh, UL listed um, charging equipment that's out there. We know which, how many companies there are that do it. And um, there's exactly one other company outside of us that is doing it all in-house, meaning running, being a site operator, doing the software, doing the, the hardware, doing deployment uh, under one roof. It's us and Tesla. And um, I, I think Tesla's product uh, was great five years ago. I think our product is significantly uh, better uh, as we're focusing on it. Um, we do everything from vehicle inlet all the way to utility feed, uh, including all the software and hardware, and we're a site operator. I think, uh, and this, this, this view has been reinforced running a site, that this is really critical for the time being to have high reliability. Um, the uh, hardware is not a commodity, uh, although yes, there's a lot of people deploying this commodity version of EV charging, which is the same thing you guys see all the time, a pedestal with one to two plugs. This is you know, a race to the bottom in terms of the cost of this. I've seen this in China. It's not the right equipment. And so maybe that's a commodity, but um, the systems that you really need, which are systems that are going to talk to all the other systems that are in the area and be real grid resources, um, are not at all a commodity. In fact, um, our systems are pretty unique in the market. Um, and the systems that we build, the hardware that we built is a system of systems. So you have a bunch of internal components, um, a, a lot of different firmware, a, a lot of different um, controllers that have to talk to each other. And then you have to talk to every single EV, which itself is a computer and the EVs themselves change um, model to model. And so, and then you have to have the software to manage the system. And then you have to have the software that liaises with all the other systems. And increasingly, we'd like to liaise much more um, frequently and you know more real time, even faster than five minute meters, uh, smart meters with the utility. Getting all this stuff to work together is is not easy, and and you really need to be on the ground as a site operator and have full control over all these systems. Payment processing, which is a pain point for people, it really shouldn't be. We're able to pay for everything else. Um, I think being um, I think it's really important at this phase of the development to be able to have full control over all the elements of the systems so that, you know, we'll, we'll show you the next slide. We have had 100% reliability at a site level, but, you know, behind the, under the hood of the 100% reliability is identifying issues that maybe are not, to, are not yet resulting in anything the customer would see, right? But it's something that we think needs to be better and we think needs to be more reliable. And so if you're not a unique, if you're not a full stack solution site operator, I, I think, getting reliability levels where they should be is virtually impossible. And that's why you're seeing terrible reliability, um, you know, customer satisfaction from Electrify America and EVgo sites, right, which are the main ones. Um, and um, I, I don't know, uh, of course, like the city has deployed a fair amount, um, but, you know, you can look at the difference just anecdotally at people showing up and making videos and doing reviews of our site, and you can see the difference for our site, and also you could see the difference with Tesla. So I think this is very, very, very important. Um, number two, um, we say no dedicated power required. Again, the point here is to have very flexible power sharing where we could take different um, inputs, uh, different power uh, from different areas, and we can take into account different loads. We're sharing power with the site or maybe multiple sites or multiple feeds, and, and then we're able to share with every one of our deeps, every one of our access points, we're able to do this on a real-time basis, on a second-by-second -second basis, which means we're able to adjust the power to each deep from you know, 1 to 500 kilowatts right now. Uh, that'll get higher, by the way, especially with medium-heavy duty. 
And that is critical, you know? And so people that talk about power sharing and what they mean is like a first come first serve or 50-50 or, you know, some of the sort of first instances of, I, it's just the words are the same words, but it's just not comparable at all. And I think, again, this is critical to create Moshi, the right size I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the five minutes and you also have a question. Did you wanna try to answer a question now or complete this? Uh, maybe I'll complete. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm no. get onto the internet stuff on this. Yeah. Okay, so no dedicated power. And the last thing is no dedicated space. So all of our units can fit in any parking footprint with no additional space. Okay, go on. Okay, so uh, just the, the previous slide that we showed, this is deployed. If you haven't seen our site on 42nd Street, we encourage you to come see it. Uh, it's open every day. Um, and uh, you can see for yourself the differences. Okay, so the next slide. So this is uh, what I was showing earlier. Again, the way we see the future of distribution is what we call as kind of a power hub. We we'll think of that as the software that's running our system. That is, uh, and hardware, right, our entire system. We're connecting to one or multiple buildings, right? So in the case of 42nd Street, there's two separate buildings, one on 9th Avenue, one on 10th Avenue. Um, we are communicating directly with all the, the cars um, and you know, utility feeds. Uh, we're also communicating with building management software, which includes you know, PV, heating, cooling systems, additional VESS, et cetera. Um, and then we're very flexibly able to communicate with very large clusters of, of uh, deeps. And so the, to, to sort of get to the recommendations again, I think that we have just one more slide, right? Yeah, so to get to the recommendations again, I think that in order to hit the targets that we need, we need flexible sharing between the EV batteries, the building loads, and all power sources. And I think the way to do this is to adapt the interconnection process. So as John was mentioning, like when we when you determine how much power is available, um, think about this is a cluster. So the power is going to be used all together with everything else. Like, can we onboard EVs when we know that there'll be a power source and power sync using the new technology that's out there? adjusting the utility incentive programs. Like right now, they're mostly tilted at total dedicated power in the site. In Manhattan Plaza, we have 12 kilowatt, we have 12 megawatts of nameplate capacity. We're using less than two, we connected three. So you really wanna incentivize a big gap between nameplate capacity and dedicated capacity for the sharing. Um, and, uh, and really the most important thing is we need very robust collaboration uh, with all the different grid of the future programs that you're doing with site operators and validation that the site operators are using um, hardware and software that is the right hardware and software that achieves this goal. So the last, uh, this is the last slide. Um, yeah, so once you do that, you start going from these peaky type of, um, you know, loads that you go with the uncertainty that the utilities are feeding for what happens past the meter to something where we can give you guys back much more predictable flexible, smooth loads. We're gonna be very active participants in, in, in grid programs, both primary um, and uh, ancillary. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be good citizens and very productive citizens in uh, helping transition to this sort of new uh, future. So thank you for that. I'll just pause here and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. This is just fascinating. Um, we do have a question. Zach, go ahead. Oh, Hi, did you? Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, yes. Uh, Zach Wigan from the Vehicle Grid Integration Council or VGIC. Um, I have a, a, maybe a few questions, but I know we're pretty short on time. So uh, just, uh, I guess, a, a, a short one and then and then maybe Moshe, if I can follow up offline, that'd be great um, if you're sure. open to that. Uh, when you're talking about your bi-directional charging solution or you, and, and the vision that you described around deeps, I think it's very exciting um, and I'd love to learn more. One question I had is, um, are you uh, envisioning the, uh, the bi-directional charging configuration being AC or DC? In other words, will the power conversion functions be on board the vehicle or, um, or off board the vehicle? Currently, we're, we're, we're using uh, DC, all DC systems. Um, uh, we can follow up offline and we're actually finding that full DC systems in a lot of installations are can even be seen as level two killers on a cost basis. We're seeing this in large distribution systems. So right now they're DC systems. 
Excellent. Thanks. And yeah, again, would love to follow up. I can drop my email in the chat and, and sure, the, uh, sure. Thank you. There. Thank, you. Thank you for that. Yes. I'm not seeing any other questions. I really appreciate the interesting um, presentation. Um, we can move on to um, Volterra with Tom Ashley. Tom, do you want us to present the slides or are you able to? You weren't able to, right? We'll pull them up. Thanks, Lisa. Yes, if you all can, can do that, uh, appreciate it. Uh, we can, well, thanks. So a uh, pleasure to be here. Appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, certainly welcome questions as we're going along, um, or subsequently, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is really through the lens of what, um, I or Volterra describes as a charging depot. I think it's fairly similar to, um, what the other presenters have been talking about, but I, I did want to just uh, describe that a little bit more. And also, uh, I'm going to be using the term energization, which, you know, everyone may be on the same page with, but I'll just go ahead and say that uh, at least the way I use the term energization, uh, it's all encompassing for uh, either providing new service uh, to a, a newer existing site or upgrading existing service at uh, effectively a, a new or existing site. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so I realize not everyone may be super familiar with Volterra. Um, part of that is because we launched just a little over two years ago. Part of that is because while we have been engaged in New York, we have not yet acquired a site or worked to develop a project um, within the state. Um, but part of it is until quite recently, uh, our customers uh, were exclusively fleets um, and the majority of our customers uh, have not authorized us to name uh, them or announce that we're working with them. So a little bit under the radar, um, but the business model that Volterra is taking forward, um, there are definitely different terminologies out there, and this is not necessarily my recommended one, um, but uh, as you see on screen, uh, I think it's fair to call this, this business model charging infrastructure as a service. Uh, sometimes we also say site as a service, but I think if you can see on screen, uh, this is really uh, kind of encompassing the full picture of um, identifying and acquiring a site in the first place, uh, and then uh, working through power procurement with our utility partners, uh, and ultimately uh, designing, constructing, and operating uh, charging facilities on behalf of our customers. Um, and would just note that, you know, these charging facilities uh, rarely are just chargers. Um, so uh, most of our fleet customers also are looking for bathrooms and other amenities to support uh, their workforce when they're on site. Um, and we uh, have more recently, I wouldn't say pivoted, but expanded to support sort of the umbrella of what I would describe as branded charging networks. Um, and a number of those entities are also looking at providing sort of convenience retail as part of uh, the sites that, that they're developing. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a little bit of a snapshot, which is fairly accurate of sort of where Volterra is currently. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, Volterra launched just a little over two years ago. Um, we had a couple sites that were sort of in motion prior to that, um, that point, um, because we spun out of, um, uh, an organization that, uh, is a data center, uh, developer. So have a lot of experience with some of what, uh, you'll hear me talking about today, including kind of the real estate side. 
uh, including working effectively with with utilities on on energization. Um, so the the blue uh, dots that you see um, are markets that Volterra has been particularly active in. Uh, the majority of which, but not including the New York uh, dots that you see, uh, do include sites that Volterra owns. Uh, at this point, uh, two years in, uh, Volterra uh, owns and leases um, uh, a little over 20 properties nationally. Um, and as you can see, there are some, some properties or some markets that are sort of on the horizon. Uh, one important note that, um, you know, really plays a big role in how we and I think about uh, sort of the appropriate uh, timelines for energization of, of these projects is that the majority of the dots on this map or markets on this map are customer driven. So Volterra's customers have said, hey, we need X number of chargers or charging sites in Y market by uh, X date. And so um, that sort of starts the process, which you saw on the, the prior slide, um, starts on, on kind of the site identification end, but uh, ultimately kind of runs through the gamut of necessary development steps. Um, so it's it's often a case where Volterra is operating under uh, basically strict requirements that are derived from our fleet customers who either have regulatory uh, requirements that they're trying to meet, depending on uh, the geographic market that we're talking about, um, or have uh, organizational uh, commitments, some of which are sort of under the banner of, of ESG. And in some cases, they then have customer commitments on, on the other end, and it can become a little bit of a sort of a nesting doll of commitments and timelines driving commitments and timelines. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a shot from uh, one of Volterra's uh, three operating sites. Um, this is a site that officially launched uh, earlier this year. Uh, it's in Southern California, um, just off uh, one of the freeways and a handful of miles north of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Um, it is a truck charging site um, that features 65 uh, charging stalls. Um, additionally, uh, Volterra had a, a pre-existing um, rideshare charging site that actually is, is using level two chargers. Uh, and then uh, just uh, this summer, uh, we launched a new rideshare charging site uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, we also have quite a number of sites uh, at various stages of development, uh, including a, a handful of sites that we anticipate to go live uh, either uh, by the end of this year um, or relatively early in uh, 2025. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I, I just wanted to provide this, this framing um, because I, I know that, uh, and please believe me, it's, it's part of my responsibility for Volterra. Um, uh, sometimes it feels like energization is absolutely everything associated with um, an EV charging project. Um, but just wanted to provide the context that, you know, and I'll just read, Energization is a critical dependency, but only one of a number of key factors essential to deploy charging hubs. And uh, we can go to the next, next slide. Um, so here's a, a little bit more of the color and some of the other factors that, that are really critical in, in doing this. And I, I would just wanna pause for a moment because you know, I certainly get questions fairly regularly from quite informed stakeholders who ask me the question of, well, why are new sites needed? Why can't fleets just electrify uh, at their own depots um, or behind their fence? And, you know, I'll say a few things, um, but there, there really are quite a number of scenarios. Um, so there's certainly the scenario where, uh, and this is very common, where fleets lease um, their facilities. They don't own them. And either their landlord isn't motivated to uh, support them on their electrification journey, 
um, or they are not motivated, the fleets themselves, to make the infrastructure commitment at that site due to the fact that it's leased not owned or potentially due to the fact that the upfront capital costs are more than the fleet wants to deal with or maybe is able to deal with in some circumstances. Um, the level of expertise uh, required um, in the planning, the build out, uh, and the operating phases may not fit uh, the fleet's uh, personnel strategy. Um, and in many cases, quite frankly, the timeline for energizing at uh, some of the existing fleet depots uh, doesn't meet the timelines that fleets may have uh, from a regulatory regulatory standpoint to transition. Um, there are a number of other factors, but also wanted to flag that by and large, uh, at least in the truck space, um, you know, what we're hearing is that fleets don't really like the idea of public charging, um, even though that's a predominant uh, model for at least on-road uh, fueling of traditional trucks. Um, and it's, it's quite simple. Um, they need operational uh, planning and temporal confidence that when they get to the charger, it's going to be there, available for them to use and working, uh, and then can get the truck driver, et cetera, back on the road as, as quickly as possible. And that is just not really what the, the current paradigm is out there for sort of public charging, um, you know, truck or otherwise. And so there are a lot of sort of hybrid models of reservations and kind of partial multi-fleet depots that, that are emerging, but all of it is really to uh, drive the confidence and operational requirements that, that fleets have. Um, so here are a couple of the, the factors uh, that, you know, really are critical in Volterra's uh, deployments. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that there are some scenarios where Volterra may be willing to uh, work on an existing customer's footprint or behind their fence. Uh, but uh, to date, all of the projects that Volterra has deployed or is in the process of deploying are at Volterra sites that we have acquired uh, primarily through purchase and in a couple cases through lease. Uh, so real estate, really big one. Um, so the site needs to be available to buy. Uh, that doesn't need to be it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be on the market. Um, our real estate team is definitely uh, accomplished at finding off market uh, properties. And there are some cases, especially in the case of government owned property, where um, you know purchasing may not be on the table, but leasing uh, may be. And so that is something that, uh, Volterra certainly considers, uh, but the, the term length of the lease is, is a really critical factor in, in that scenario. Um, I don't mean to, to be flip about this. A uh, customer is really critical or a customer interest, or in some cases, basically proximity to, you know, known fleet or customer hotspots. Um, but quite frankly, uh, Volterra is not really willing to commit investment dollars to buy a property without a pretty clear conviction that customers are going to be uh, ready to use and contract uh, for use at that site in a relatively short period of time. Um, not a topic that I plan to spend time on here. I am happy to answer a quick question or two, um, but do want to acknowledge that land use policy and zoning is a really critical challenge for uh, developing this model of uh, charging hubs at, at new sites. Uh, quite simply, it's a case that many uh, authorities having jurisdiction don't have land use policy that addresses this type of use. Uh, some, uh, and in certain geographies, many, authorities having jurisdiction do have a uh, policy that enables some for form of streamlined permitting of EV charging. But uh, what we've been finding is that uh, many, um, many cities are thinking about that really just from an equipment standpoint, the chargers themselves. And so if we have a customer who has asked us to build restrooms or something else, 
that um, is often not fitting within uh, the way that City X is approaching uh, permitting streamlining for, for EV charging. Um, and in a number of geographies, uh, Volterra has actually had to work actively over long periods of time with uh, city staff to develop new uh, ordinances or land use policy to enable uh, EV charging depots. Um, you see energization, we'll talk uh, mostly about that, um, but uh, quite simply, uh, Volterra is not going to spend many millions of dollars buying a property or committing to a lease of X number of years without significant confidence that the project can be energized in a timeline that meets customer needs. Um, and also, last but not least, economics have to work. Um, and I'll just acknowledge that uh, by and large in this space, uh, the cost of bringing these new charging depots online uh, does not fit with uh, fleets willingness or ability to pay um, for them. And, and that's where the many different types of incentives that exist nationally, um, statewide, regionally, within certain utility service areas it, are so critical. Um, they are really necessary for this type of model to work um, for fleets and other customers. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this type of model is increasingly feeling necessary for many, many fleets and uh, other types of, of customers. Um, I, I do want to just uh, clarify there's some iconography on this slide. Um, so I showed a, a photo of a, of a truck charging site uh, that's a class eight uh, drayage use case. Uh, I talked verbally about rideshare charging. Those are regular old passenger cars. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, we are uh, actively engaged with customers or potential customers across other um, kind of vehicle segments as well. Um, and uh, there are, in some cases, different power level requirements. There are certainly different charging stall sizes that are relevant. There are different turning radiuses that are necessary depending on the, the size of the vehicle. Um, and all of those factor into each of these pieces. So the real estate footprint in the first place, who the customers are, how many of them there may be for a site, um, in some cases factors into the land use um, policy and approval process. Uh, and absolutely has a role in a uh, combination of, of energization and economics. Uh, let's go to the next slide, uh, which is my final slide, but uh, we'll spend a fair amount of time here. Uh, so do want to acknowledge again, um, these recommendations are driven by direct experience that I and the Volterra team have had. Um, and uh, primarily, this is experience outside of New York. Um, a lot of it uh, is in California, to be sure. Um, and depending on our timing today, um, we'll just acknowledge that uh, Volterra and much of the industry has been very actively involved in quite a number of regulatory proceedings in California that are relevant to today's topic. Um, so happy to uh, take questions or share some perspective um, about some of that uh, as, as helpful. Um, but here are a couple recommendations. Um, there are certainly more. There are sub-recommendations under these, these recommendations, but um, I, I think this pretty well captures uh, some of the big pieces that uh, you know, we're learning, seeing, being challenged by, and in some cases seeing as um, you know, positive precedent where utilities are, are starting to get it right, where commissions are starting to figure it out and provide the enabling policy and kind of resourcing construct that, that utilities need to be able to do some of this work. Um, this, this first recommendation around minimizing assessment time and complexity, I, I really want to emphasize this because I think we all know that, you know, the physical work to upgrade 
infrastructure, whatever that infrastructure may be. That takes a certain amount of time and varies uh, based on a number of factors. But in this case, I think one of the big challenges that Volterra has experienced is it may very well take six or more months before we have enough information and enough detail uh, from our utility partner on the energization timeline cost complexity of a project before we can actually start on such a project. Um, and that is often a time period where uh, a property has been put under contract by Volterra to purchase, um, but ultimately we're not pulling the trigger on purchasing it again uh, for many millions of dollars in uh, numerous cases uh, until we have that level of detail and clarity, uh, and in some cases certainty uh, from our utility partners on, on what that looks like. And so you heard some, some discussion earlier of hosting maps or capacity maps. Uh, those are, are really uh, important tools, um, but I just want to emphasize that no one is going to buy a multi-million dollar property just based on information available uh, in a capacity map online. Um, and so it's a great sort of top of the funnel. It really is a helpful tool to give a sense of where hot spots or cold spots, if you will, may exist on the distribution system. But uh, certainly in Volterra's case, the fast follow uh, is then uh, some form of load study request, depending on the terminology used by uh, the utility or jurisdiction that that's, that's relevant to. Uh, and what I would say is uh, a broad range of experience about what that load assessment looks like, how detailed it is, how long it takes to get. Um, and in many cases, uh, that load assessment does not provide enough detail. And then the only way um, in some utility processes, again, in other parts of the country, to get the necessary detail is to file a formal application for service. Um, and uh, by and large, that requires a full set of plans, which depending on the type of project, uh, may implicate a quarter million dollars of costs um, in terms of external engineering resources to put that together. In other cases, uh, lesser detail may um, kind of meet the threshold necessary for the utility to kind of formalize that process. But then there's a time period associated with that uh, assessment from the formal application process as well. Uh, so just want to acknowledge like if this sounds like a lot, it certainly feels like a lot, and it takes a lot of time, and that time really is is money uh, for Volterra in relation to delivering for our customers. Um, and in some cases, we have to pay um, for uh, the contract that we're under with with a seller. So even before potentially purchasing, uh, may need to pay the seller a certain amount for a certain period of time. Uh, to enable uh, that option uh, to purchase. Um, so I'm going to transition to this second recommendation. And uh, to be frank, <laughs> this may be the hardest um, of, of all, um, sort of lining up with, with the next recommendation. Um, but as you just heard from me, uh, there's a fair amount of administrative process within uh, the utilities processes uh, and there's a fair amount of administrative or regulatory process that many utilities have to go through uh, with their regulators to be able to build some of the upgrades that may be required. And all of that, uh, while in some cases uh, may be necessary, uh, it's all time that many fleets don't have. Um, and in, in other cases where Volterra may not have. Um, I'll, I'll just spend a, a quick um, moment popping out here. Um, I, I would say as a general rule of thumb right now, especially in the truck space, which I think is a, a really useful uh, area to focus on for, for energization and a lot of these uh, challenges, 
uh, and opportunities for uh, for efficiency. So right now, I, I would say you can generally uh, place an order and gain um, a class A truck, electric truck, in somewhere between six to 12 months. Uh, and I would say the general expectation around the industry right now is that it then takes two to four times longer uh, to get the infrastructure in place. Um, and uh, in some cases, fleets just don't have that amount of time to meet either their regulatory obligations or be on track to meet them, uh, or in other cases, meet customer obligations. Um, and so um, generally, I think pretty good rule of thumb, at least with truck projects, and I do want to acknowledge this is outside of you know, the, the New York City metro, which I think everyone knows has additional complexities, um, is if projects have energization timelines communicated to them of over two years, generally those projects aren't being built. Um, and so I, I'd say that's the general threshold in the industry right now for truck charging projects, two years. Um, but it's very evident that fleets really are mostly interested in talking about projects that are coming online in less than 12 months. So just wanted to, to level set a little bit on that. And so, you know, kind of this, this upfront process on getting the assessment uh, to power uh, for a site, uh, and then, you know, depending on the regulatory environment or circumstance, potentially having some regulatory boxes that need to be checked. That's just time that doesn't work or isn't going to work um, to enable uh, electrification at, at scale. And so the recommendation is to really try to attack and eliminate um, those, if you want to call them soft costs, but, um, you know, really, in some cases, time intensive uh, steps that uh, really inhibit uh, and add time to, to the overall energization process. Um, very, very importantly, I'll go to recommendation number three, um, because, you know, in California, for instance, and I would say generally, utilities are quite motivated to do this work and enable uh, charging projects. Um, but for instance, in California, they don't really have clear regulatory authority, at least in terms of um, sort of the financial side to, to do that work. Um, and uh, so there's been a, a big focus on uh, lining up on timelines to then drive more clarity about resources that are required to do the work. Um, but there are other jurisdictions where the resources are already there, either through a rider or some other uh, type of regulatory mechanism. Uh, and therefore, the timelines may be less relevant because the utility already has the tools, by and large, uh, that it may need to be able to, to do the work. Um, and so just want to really emphasize, like, it does not work to have sort of unfunded mandates in this space. Uh, it's really critical to kind of get it right in enabling the, the resources that uh, utilities uh, need to, to do this work. And in some cases, quite frankly, commissions need to assess some of this work. There are definitely um, bottlenecks in terms of um, staff capacity at, at a number of commissions around the country. Um, I'm going to transition to this fourth recommendation, which may sound a little bit magical, but I feel like New York is really taking some positive steps uh, in, in this direction and may be able to set a real precedent for, for the industry. So I, I'll just, I'll illustrate in this way. So if a project is going to take four years uh, to energize, and you heard me earlier say projects that have estimates over two years aren't getting built, then effectively, uh, to make this work, um, there has to be a two-year head start on some of the work necessary to deliver power to these projects. Um, and really, sort of that working ahead or eliminating some of the lag time 
um, is in some cases, I, I believe currently the only way that projects are going to be built or built in a timely fashion in a way that works for uh, for the customers who who need these uh, chargers to to go online in a certain time frame. And so, you know, I, I really do um, think that that New York is taking very positive steps in this area. Um, while sure, utilities don't know where Volterra and others may helicopter into in terms of identifying. Uh, new sites to bring online as charging hubs, by and large, utilities have increasingly been gaining clarity of where existing fleets are currently, where they're domiciled, uh, and in some cases, you know, the types of routes that they operate. And so those hotspots uh, can really translate into pretty clear signals um, to enable uh, utilities to be in a position to thoughtfully plan and start doing upgrade work on the distribution system ahead of specific or explicit demand at individual sites. Um, also want to acknowledge this, this next recommendation, and, and this is again, it's, it's coming from outside of California, um, don't have direct experience uh, working through utility process in New York on this. But going back to number one, sort of that assessment, uh, pretty much the way this works um, in Volterra's experience is, you know, we ask for 10 megawatts. Uh, and then, you know, we get some level of information back, some sense of timeline for delivering that 10 megawatts, most of which tends to be outside of two years. Um, what we don't get back is, hey, Volterra, uh, we can deliver you three megawatts in a year. We can deliver you another three megawatts nine months later, and then we can deliver the remaining uh, four megawatts in that four years that we quoted you after we've upgraded uh, the substation or built a new one. Um, and so that type of power phasing uh, is, is really, uh, really valuable. Uh, in many cases, Volterra and other uh, entities in this sort of charging hub space uh, can deploy storage, can manage charging, can work with customers to build projects in phases such that that 10 megawatts or whatever the initial ask is may not be, you know, required to start building the project and start electrifying that fleet. Um, but what I'll just say is that I think there's a significant opportunity for, um, for the commission uh, to encourage, enable, and for utilities, if they're not already doing it, um, to provide Volterra and others in this space more detail on what what the possibilities may be around uh, bringing in phased power. Um, and also acknowledge again outside of New York in any event, uh, some utilities are really aware of how long it takes to do some of this work and are thinking creatively about how they can bring temporary or bridge power solutions to the table. Um, most of which include storage or, or something else that may be able to create a bridge between that three megawatts and the 10, or in some cases may be able to bring, um, create a bridge between less than a megawatt and, and something else um, that can enable um, a project to, to go forward. Uh, lastly, and this is, is sort of internal to utilities, but in some cases may implicate uh, regulatory approval to higher up uh, staff, but uh, I, I will share this. So I joined Volterra in May of 2023. Uh, since then, 100% of projects that Volterra has been working on have required escalation within utilities. Um, and, and that's where I get particularly involved. I engage an executive team member of a utility uh, and educate them about the project uh, and then ask for their help in supporting their teams um, do the work that that's needed. Uh, and in some cases, um, it, it really does require that level of attention to ensure that 
uh, some of the existing barriers are overcome, or in some cases, some of the stage gates are being handled concurrently rather than serially. Um, and so we're definitely seeing a, a little bit more of a transition to kind of more consistent personnel uh, within utilities who developers like uh, Volterra can work with. Um, and I'll just share that, you know, this is a model that we've been developing where we have a single point of contact uh, with any utility. Yes, we have engagement with all sorts of other personnel who are involved in different aspects of the project, but that single point of contact is empowered and enabled to work through challenges, to escalate internally, um, to help address some of the, the challenges that lead to some of the, the timelines um, that, that are, are not working well for, for the industry. So I, I just, I really want to acknowledge that, that many utilities uh, have sort of key account type constructs, um, but it, it's really uh, been Volterra's experience that it's necessary to have a champion uh, within a utility who can work collaboratively across teams uh, and uh, can, can call on, in some cases, leadership to provide support um, to address uh, barriers or, or roadblocks. Um, so that's all I have here. Um, uh, you can probably stop the screen sharing, um, but really appreciate the time. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, certainly happy to address uh, specific or general questions, uh, if there are some now, um, or be somewhat available to this group in a, in a forward manner um, on, on these topics. Not seeing any questions, Tom, right now. Um, but I'd like to thank you so much for your really interesting um, perspective and recommendations. Um, I thought your recommendations were well thought out and really, really helpful. So I appreciate you presenting today, and I'm happy to hear that um, if we need you in the future, you may be available to us. Um, okay. Still pleasure. not seeing any questions, so I think we're going to wrap this up. Um, we have 15 minutes. I we had um, Nicerta, I mean, I'm sorry, Con Ed was going to present, but um, Katie, we're going to hold off on that until next um, month. October 23rd is our next meeting. And Nicole, can you just bring up my presentation? Sorry, Katie, go ahead. Yep, that works for us. Thank you. Great. Um, so, as I was saying, the next um, every WIG meeting is scheduled for October 23rd. Um, at that time, right now, we have presentations scheduled from EPRI and GridFast and, of course, Con Ed. Um, for the remaining agenda today, let's see, go to the next, next slide. Next one. Um, so last um, every WIG meeting, people brought up, you know, what other proceedings that are relevant, what other commission proceedings that are relevant to um, EV charging. So I just listed them here with a little blurb of what they are. If anybody's interested, these will be available to you. And there was, you can go to the next slide, Nicole. And then the next one. And then the other discussion that we had was flexible interconnection. And I did talk to our colleagues here at DPS um, and it is being addressed in the interconnection technical working group. So therefore, it won't be addressed in this group. Um, but that's all we have for today, unless anybody has anything else. Um, any other questions? If not, we can call it a day. Thank you so much for the presenters. I thought the present presentations were very knowledgeable and, um, and uh, super helpful. Go ahead, Cole. Thanks, Lisa. Just a question on that last point on the flexible interconnection. I know that that working group has been working mainly on interconnection around distributed generation, rooftop solar, other things like that. So is that working group now working on distributed load? So is there addressing flexible interconnection about both flexible interconnection of generation and load, basically? Um, that was my understanding when I spoke to him about it. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No problem.
All righty. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate everyone's time. Have a good day.